Just saying. Take your Bibles this morning with me, if you would, and open to 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and 3, and we're eventually going to uh, uh, jump over to Luke 15 a little bit this morning as, uh, as we get started. Our topic is living in the pig pen this morning, and I couldn't pass up the opportunity to have my favorite Peanuts character on the screen. Um, we, are, we are soul partners, pig pen and I. Um, I like him, so just thought I'd put that up there so you could, if nothing else, you could say, you know, I really enjoyed that first slide. That was, from there it was downhill. All right, like modern day Enoch's, some Christians walk so closely to God that they live what seems to us from afar to be heavenly lives on earth. Now, it doesn't mean that all they ever have are golden street pearly gate experiences. In fact, those kind of folks suffer just as much as anybody else. But the difference is that they seem to carry with them a deep-seated peace of faith. A steadfastness that only comes to those who practice daily living in in the presence of God. These believers on earth, but their heart beat, it's almost as if it beats to a heavenly rhythm. Now, other Christians, heirs of the same kingdom, instead choose to live in a pig pen wallowing in sin slop. They squander that part of their spiritual inheritance which is intended to be enjoyed here on earth. They trade it in for uh, time in the slime of their own selfishness. These earthly believers are still headed for heaven, but frankly, if you'll pardon the phrase, living for hell on earth. So what about these pig pen Christians. What about those believers who claim the name of Christ, but it seems as if they never, ever really leave the sin in their lives? One common theory that folks like to say is, well, they were never saved to begin with. That they maybe believed in their heads, but never, never in their hearts. They never really committed themselves. Another idea is that they're saved, but somehow they've lost their salvation. They sincerely found redemption, but let it slip through their muddy little fingers. Now, although you can take the scripture and twist it to to do whatever you want, the answer Paul gives in 1 Corinthians best supports the biblical truth about the eternal destiny of of those that we might call pig pen Christians. And what I want us to do today is to look at Paul's rebuke to these pig pen Christians, or some of you may be uncomfortable with that terminology. We think of them as carnal, carnal Christians. And we need to be challenged as we walk through here to look for ourselves, if you will, in in a certain way, and to come out of that pig pen that we perhaps may have in our own lives. So Paul begins this morning, and he uh, gives us three kinds of people found in, in, in 1 Corinthians 2 and 3. Now in 1 Corinthians 2, verses 14 through chapter 3 and verse 4, Paul talks about three types of people. And what we want to see uh, here this morning as we begin is, is really... Uh, Well, first is the natural people. Look at chapter 2 and verse 14. But the natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit, for they are foolishness to him, and cannot be understood by by them, because they are spiritually appraised. And this morning, I'm, I'm reading out of the New American Standard, so I'll just give you that information up front. Now, the people he's talking about here, these natural people, these are the lost, the unsaved. The spiritually dead. And Paul describes them here. Natural people have pulled in the welcome mat from the door of their hearts. 
The deadbolt is locked and they've turned a deaf ear to the knocking of Jesus. What an incredible picture. Last Sunday as, as, as Jason Nightingale was sharing his testimony and he used that picture of the house and he used the verse from Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20 where Jesus is knocking on the door. What a beautiful picture that is, and, and, and we saw that as, as he shared that with us, and he said that he went down and he opened the door and Jesus came in. But there are some who have shut the door, locked the door with the deadbolt, perhaps even moved the big upright piano over in front of the door. They don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear the knocking. They don't want any part of it. This is the natural man or natural people. There's a second group here that Paul talks about, and these are the spiritual people. They have been uh, saved. They are enjoying fellowship with God. They're active, productive members of the body of Christ. Uh, if you look back just quickly to chapter 1 and verse 26, it says, For consider your calling, brethren, that not many were wise among the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen all of those uh, uh, things to shame the wise. He's chosen the weak things of the world, uh, which to... Uh, are, are to shame the, the strong. And he goes all the way through there. And he says that we have the mind of Christ. Those who are spiritual are those who are focused on Christ, focused on following hard after him, focused on growing and changing and desiring that. It's, it's that desire to, to not not be happy with some level of mediocrity. Not to ever say, well, I'm just pretty comfortable right where I'm at. But to always desire and want more. The third group that Paul talks about here are the fleshly people. These are the ones who are rooted in their the pig pens of their own nature, rebelling against the control of the Holy Spirit. These are the ones that Paul was referring to here in, in the Corinthian church. And he describes them in four ways. Okay, so if you're taking notes this morning, you, you'll want to get this. He describes carnal believers in four ways. First of all, he says, number one, don't miss this. They are Christians. He addresses them... Now, remember, he's writing to the church at Corinth. He addresses them in chapter 1 and verse 2 to the churches in Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ, saints, by calling. So he's talking to them as saints. In chapter 3 and verse 1, he says, And I, brethren, he calls them brothers, brothers and sisters in Christ. So understand, as we begin talking about this, as we begin talking about those who are carnal, that they are those who are saved. Brothers and sisters in Christ. Paul is clearly speaking to believers. Now, I didn't say they were true believers, but he's still speaking to believers. Look at verse 1. And I, brethren, there's the believers, could not speak to you as spiritual men, but as men of flesh or carnal, as to infants or babes in Christ. So they're saved, but, but he's got to talk to them like they're children. Could you imagine what that'd be like if, if, if that happened in your workplace? You know, John Stam shows up for work. And his boss comes up, John, come here, buddy. Come here, John. He's a good boy. You know, pat him on the head. You know, I need you to take a truck and run over to New Sherry. You do that. He's a good boy. Yeah. <laughs> what? Oh, I'm sorry. That really happens? Oh. <laughs> now, now, we laugh at that. But Paul is saying to them, listen, I can't talk to you about spiritually heavy things. I have to treat you like children, literally, as babes or infants. Now that's cute. Who doesn't love babies? Everybody loves babies. 
But you ever notice, I don't care how tough you think you are, how much of a manly man you are, put a newborn baby in a guy's hands and he's going to go, where did you give me? <laughs> it, it, it's what we do. And that's what Paul's saying here, is he's got to talk to them like they're babies. Now here's the second thing. We know they're Christians, but, but secondly, they lack spiritual growth. Look at what he says in verse 2. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not able to receive it. Indeed, now, even now, you are not able. Nobody expects an infant to eat a T-bone steak. Okay, now I'm hungry. Nobody, nobody would expect it. You don't take an infant and put him in, you know, the, 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 the little rocky thing, you know, that you, you feed him this, you know. Yeah, exactly. It's terrible. And, and, and you put a stake in front of him. You say, Pastor, that's ridiculous. Absolutely, because the baby's not ready for steak. That's why dads love it when we feed steak to kids, because then we have to eat it for them. It's, it's a tough thing, all right? But understand, nobody expects a new believer to be able to digest the meatiest doctrines of Scripture or of faith. New Christians need to be bottle-fed theology, basic formulas, until they have the teeth to cut into solid food. We don't bring in new Christians and immediately drop things like election and free will and, and, and you know, all those kind of, look, what do we teach them? Love Jesus, love God's word, right? Walk with God, that's what they need to know. And as they do that and as they grow, we can bring in some of those more, more meaty doctrines. Because trust me, some of those things are hard to wrestle through when you've walked with God for years. Amen? We, we understand that. And so that's part of that process. The tragedy is that these Christians that Paul is writing to have, should have been mature, but they were still babes in Christ. They should have been weaned, but they were still clinging to their bottles. That's what it says here at the end of verse 2. It says, for you were not able to receive it. Indeed, even now, you're still not able to receive it. Do you remember what the writer of Hebrews said? Let's leave the elemental things. Let's leave the nursery and step on for God. Don't just, don't just stay there but have a desire to move on. So they're Christians, but they lack spiritual growth. Now, now here's the third thing Paul says about them. They nurse unconfessed sin. Carnal Christians feed their old nature and starve their new nature. Look at verse 3. For you are still fleshly. For since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly, and are you not walking like mere men, natural men, carnal men? That's what Paul's asking them. Paul expresses heartache over their spiritual emaciation. They're starving to death. They're not feeding themselves. They're nursing, if you will. They're nurturing unconfessed sin. They're not willing to admit that they have a sin problem. They're not willing to admit that they're struggling in, a, in an area of their lives. They're not willing to admit that. They're, they're just, uh, everything, everything's fine. Everything's fine. You know, we do the same thing. I think I've shared this story before. It's called the miracle of the parking lot. You get up on Sunday morning, and, and, and you and the wife, maybe you're just kind of owling with each other for whatever reason, and then the kids start in, you know? And you're, you're driving to church, and you're barking a little bit at your wife. Back down the boat. Back seat, and you pull in the parking lot. And you're just you're furious, and you, you open the car door and you step on the parking lot. And at that moment, Kent Johannes is there, and he says, "Morning, brother. How are you?" And you go, "Well, I'm fine. Thank you very much. Praise, praise God. It's all good. Thank you. Thank you." 
my beautiful wife, and she's beaming. They'll strangle you. They'll beam. <laughs> and the kids, for some reason, they get out of the car, they're all like, fuh, 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 fuh. I had a guy tell me one time he was driving down the road and, and he was trying to discipline his kid from the front. And he, kept, he kept just kind of swinging his arm back there to get the kid's attention. And the little boy goes, Daddy, it says, love one another, not hit one another. <laughs> we all, listen, can we just admit right now, together, we all have sin in our lives. There's nobody here that's perfect. Not the preacher, not the leadership, not the deacons. Nobody is perfect. We're all growing and changing. So let's just admit right up front, we all have sin in our lives. Now we've got that out of the, out of the way. The big pink elephant now is out of the room because we all understand we have sin. The difference is, is that these folks that Paul is concerned with this morning refuse to admit they have any issues. They're just going to keep nursing that sin along and not say anything about it. Number four, they resemble non-Christians. They resemble non-Christians. At the end of verse three, Paul continues and says, are you not walking like mere men? Like natural men. Carl Christians mask their redemption in the mud of the world. They act as though they were never washed by the Savior's blood. It's not a place where any of us want to be. By way of illustration this morning, I want us to take our Bibles and go back to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. A portion of Scripture for which I think all of you are probably familiar. The tale of two prodigals. In Luke chapter 15, verses 11 to 32, Jesus tells about a man with two sons, treasured members of his family, but rebels. And hear me clearly this morning when I say this, both sons are rebels in their own ways. Rebels who wandered from their father's love. Commonly known as the story of the prodigal son, it, it actually talks about two prodigal sons. One who actually ra- runs away and ends up in a pig pen, and the other who stayed home and acts respectable, but was in a pig pen as well. And this morning, what I want us to do by way of, of observation and 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 just illustration is to walk through this narrative and see where we might be found as well as make a couple of observations. Now the first person that that we're going to talk about is the runaway rebel. Now the younger son is one type of a carnal Christian, the type who doesn't try to mask his rebellion or false loyalty. This famous narrative opens with him demanding his share of the inheritance and the father granting his wish. If you uh, look at uh, chapter 15 and, uh, and verse um, 11, a man had two so younger than them came to his father, he says, uh, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them. Do you, do you understand, and, and I, as I was studying this week and putting this together, I kept thinking to myself, don't get caught up in the story. I can't not tell you a little bit. You need to understand what was going on in this time period, in this culture, for a son to go to his father and say, give me my inheritance, is literally akin to saying, I wish you were dead. Give me what's mine now. I can't wait for you to die. I want mine now. That's what's being done here. I want you to see that the, 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 the father goes on here in uh, verse 13, and, or in verse 12, and so he divided his wealth between them. That's an incredible statement, that the man would even do that. His son has basically come and said, I, I wish you were dead. Give me what's mine. And the father does so. Now, 
here's, here's where the story gets sticky. Here's the downfall. <clears throat> Once a son had the money in his hot little hands, notice what the scripture says beginning in verse 13. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything and he went on a journey into a distant land where he squandered his estate with loose living. Now, when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country and he began to be impoverished. And just stop there for a second. Can, can we just make an observation here? Just a, a, a quick observation. I want you to notice that no sudden calamity fell from heaven on this kid when he left home. The bus, for lack of a better term, that he took to the distant country didn't get a flat tire. On his way there, he didn't suddenly just come down with leprosy. But understand that as we walk with God, just because the acts of consequences don't fall immediately, that they're not going to come. And don't allow the fact that because consequences don't come immediately, don't let that encourage you in your disobedience. Oh, well, I can get away with this. Oh, I'm not getting caught. I'm just going to keep going. God is not mocked whatsoever a man sows. That is what he reaps. Amen? And we need to, we need to understand that. Remember the words of Ecclesiastes 8.11. Because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed quickly, therefore the heart of the sons of men are among them given fully to do evil. In other words, because there's no repercussions, the, the heart of man will continually move toward wickedness. Why do I make that observation? Because this morning, if you're running away from the Father's love and you haven't experienced his discipline, can I simply say this? Watch out. Watch out. Scripture tells us that our Heavenly Father disciplines those whom he loves. And though it may seem that you're getting away with something right now, watch out. He's not ignoring you. He's not winking at your sin. He's not saying, dog, you old knucklehead. You know what God's doing? If you're running from him and you have sin in your life that you know you need to deal with but you won't and because you're not suffering any consequences, you just keep into it, you know what that's called? Grace. God's grace. He's giving you room to repent. So maybe that's what needs to be done. He's giving you grace, hoping that you'll soften your heart and you'll come back on your own. Okay, let's get back to the narrative. So the, the son it reaches a desperation level. We read verse uh, 14. It said that, that he spent everything. A severe famine came into the country. He began to be impoverished. Verse 15, so he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, and he sent him into the field to feed swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating, and no one gave anything to him. That's his desperation level. He is to the place where even the food that is fed to the swine looks fine to him. And by the way, as Jesus is telling this story, he is speaking primarily to a Jewish audience. True? True? Nod your heads like this, okay? I'll just give you the answer, all right? That being true, there was no more dirty, rotten, despicable, manual labor job known to a Jew than to have to go and work with pigs. They hated him. And this is what he was willing to do. Not only willing to do that, but even the food of the swine looked good to him. That is a point of desperation. Okay? So, let's look at the restoration. Knee deep in swine slop, hungry, alone, he finally comes to his senses. 
and he decides to go home. He's going to make plans to go home. Look at verse 17 and 18 very quickly. And he came to his senses and he said, how much, or excuse me, how many of my father's hired hands have more than enough bread to eat and I am here dying of hunger. But I will go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. And I am no longer worthy to be called your son, but make me as one of your hired men. And just stop there for a second. He is rehearsing this speech that he wants to, to, to give to his dad. He's going to go back to his dad. The same dad that he said, I wish you were dead. Give me my money. And he's going to say, look, I, I've sinned against you. I've sinned against heaven. I've sinned against you. And, and, and all I want to do is come back and be one of your hired hands. The story, the narrative shifts to the father who having longed for his son's return, sees him, verse 20, notice what it says, and he got up and he came to his father, but here it is, but while he was still a long way off, his father, what? Saw him. The application there is that the father was looking, gazing down the road, looking, looking every day, hoping Today would be the day that he would come home. Far from rebuking his son, the father feels compassion for him, and he runs and embraces him. Look at the rest of verse 20. And he, he felt compassion for him. He ran and he embraced him and he kissed him. His son begins his speech in verse 21, but instead of listening to him, the father sends slaves to get the best robe, a ring, and sandals for him. And then he commands the slave, prepare for a celebration in verse 23. And his exclamation in verse 24 is absolutely incredible when he says, this son of mine was dead, and he's come to life again. The lost has been found. And by the way, I want you to notice something, the, 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 the robe here. To give him the royal robe is a sign of acceptance. To give him a ring, a sign of authority and trust. And the sandals, the sign of a free man, not a slave, not a servant. What you see here is absolute, unabashed forgiveness. And that's what I want to talk about here for just a second. Here's, a, here's another observation, okay? True forgiveness. For some reason, when we have sin in our lives, we get this picture in our mind that we think that God is waiting for us to return with a, with a, with a little ball bat in his hand. You're mistaken. God deals with us with a soft and tender heart. If you're here this morning and you're running from God and you're afraid to go home because you're afraid of God's reaction, he's waiting for you. Of all of the narratives that Jesus had ever told, this is my favorite. Long before I was saved, this was my favorite. Because I can envision my mom and dad's house. I can envision how the front door sits, and the front door looks due east down Wall Avenue in Des Moines. And I had this picture in my mind ever since I was a little kid. Of my dad standing there out on the porch, looking, watching, waiting for me to come home. And what an incredible thing it is to know and to understand that when we sin and we get away from God, that he's standing there and he's waiting and he's looking and he's wanting you to come home. Come on back. Come on back. I want to talk and, and, and remind you that if you come back and you repent of your sin and you admit that you've sinned against God, you've sinned against others perhaps, 
that if you've repented, God does not want you to wallow in remorse. He wants you to return to his embrace. He wants you to walk with him. If you've asked for forgiveness, your sins have been forgiven. Get up, clean yourself off, and walk with the Lord. Let's take a quick look at the respectable rebel. The respectable rebel is the older son who doesn't share the joy of his brother's return. In fact, when he heard about it, he becomes indignant. That's a fancy word for angry. He got mad. This twerp of a brother has come back. And he refuses, the older brother refuses to join the festivities. And he complains to his father. Beginning in verse 29, he says, But he answered his father and he said, Look, for so many years I have been serving you, and I have never neglected a command of yours. And yet you never gave me a goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came who has devoured your wealth with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Do you notice the pride and the arrogance in this rebel's words? He drags his brother's name back through the mud and denies any family relationship with him. Remember what he did? Remember how bad it is? Remember how bad that sin is? Well, you can forgive him. I'm not forgiving him. That's what the older brother is saying here. Another, with another demonstration of sacrificial love, the, the father reaches out to his discurled son and he appeals to him to rejoice over the fact that his, his brother is back. He said to him, verse 31, Son, you've always been with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice for this brother of yours was dead and he's come back to life. He was lost and now he is found. And that's where the narrative ends. What a cliffhanger. Amen? What happened? Did the older brother go in? Did the younger brother? Was he respectable? Now what, what happened here? What? Where's Paul Harvey? We need the rest of the story, amen? <laughs> Crying out loud, I, I don't know. Listen, Jesus leaves that older son in a spiritual pig pen. He doesn't tell us whether or not he decided to clean up his attitude and join his brother's welcome home party. Because I think that there are certain places in the scripture that the stories are left not completed so that we have to think through and ask, how would I respond? This is one of those places. So let me ask you this. What do we learn today? I want to begin with a look in the mirror. Maybe this morning, like the younger son, there's some smudges of carnality on our faces. Our fingernails are caked with a little bit of pig pen mud. Our feet are covered in filth. Or maybe this morning, like the older son, your pig pen may have been hidden in the crisp pages of the church hymnal or in the crisp pages of a Sunday school Bible study. And that praise the Lord smile. And yet, your heart is not right with God. When you get up in the morning, when you look in the mirror, you know who you're looking at. If you see either one of these two sons, remember that the Father truly desires a relationship with you. If you've got sin in your life and you're just like, you know what, I quit, I don't care, I'm just going to go do whatever, if that's your attitude, come home. Your Heavenly Father is waiting for you to come home. He wants you to wholeheartedly love Him. 
Maybe you're like the, the older brother and you've got, you've got all the right look, you've got all the right words, you've got all the right behavior, and your heart is just as far away from God as can be. You don't have to clean up your life. You have to come and confess your sin, and he will cleanse you. That's what 1 John 1, 9 is all about. It's for believers. If we will confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's what he desires to do. And remember this. David wrote in Psalm 51, A broken and a contrite heart, O Lord, thou wilt not despise. Where are you this morning? Are you the spirit-filled Christian? The spiritual believer? Are you the carnal son who has just kind of given up, said, well, whatever? Or would you be the older son who's done everything that God's asked him to do and still has a stinky attitude in his heart? This week at VBS, we sang the song Obedience. And I want you to know I came about this close to us singing it this morning. Because in the second stanza, it says, keeping our attitudes right. How many times, adults, have we obeyed God, obeyed God's word, because we knew we had to. And we didn't do it with an attitude that was correct. Where do we see ourselves today? How would God have you respond to his word this morning? Father, we thank you for the opportunity of being here this morning to open your word and to again look into the book of 1 Corinthians. We ask God that you would just continue uh, to do a work in our lives. Father, may we heartily examine our lives. May we recognize where our deficiencies are. And Father, may we be willing to come to you and ask forgiveness, to clean up, allow you to have your work in our lives, and to move forward. Do a work in our lives this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand?